Hello, um, my name is Diane Tran, and a friend of mine asked me if uh, I could review the Avengers film. I, um, done a review of, uh, the, the New 52 during, as a guest star once, and, um, because I'm not exactly sure why she wanted me to review this, but I assume it's, uh, because, uh, one, I'm a comic book fan. Two, I'm a girl, uh, as you can tell by my ultra-masculine voice. And uh, another is that uh, I, I love comics. I watch these films. I've watched many mediums, not just live action, but also animated. So I don't know exactly uh, if I could give an opinion that hasn't been said before, but I'm going to try. And I'm going to do it in audio because I didn't want to write a 20-page essay on this. So, um, I apologize if uh, all the um, ums and ams and all that because I'm not particularly used to doing an audio recording. But uh, we'll see how this goes. If you like it, awesome. Um, there will be spoilers, but in the first... Uh, I'll tell you when there will be spoilers. Uh... First off, uh, let's talk about just the Avengers, just a non-spoiler review of the Avengers. It's great. Uh, I guess that's no surprise for anyone, but I highly recommend it. It's a fun film. Uh, the plot is simple. The I mean, it's just, what is the Avengers about? Well, obviously you have Earth's Mightiest Heroes. You have those who are super-powered and those who are not. You have Captain America, you have Thor, the God of Thunder, you have Iron Man, uh, a billionaire playboy philanthropist, uh, two S.H.I.E.L.D. assassins, um, the Hulk, and um, they're all come together to defeat the army led by Loki, the God of Mischief, which is Thor's brother. Now, that's a, a small synopsis of that. Uh, let's see, um, what can I say? Well, the plot is simple because of that, and it's, uh, you just, they come together, they fight, they bicker like an old married couple, and they come together, and they try to defeat Loki, and, uh, we have been building up to this for six to seven films, if you count the Hulk, Ang Lee's version, um, uh, six if you don't. Uh, and, uh, this is the first film of its kind, the first time we actually have seen films, not TV series, but films, these multi-million dollar films of solo characters, and then you bring them all together into this world where they really should not exist. Honestly, how do you get, um, someone like Iron Man who built himself a suit out of uh, just pure science, kind of fraternizing with the god of thunder from Norse mythology, that's kind of pretty improbable, even in comic book, uh, um, in comic book standards, um, because if you could have someone like Batman, how the hell does he, does he work with uh, Superman, who is an alien from outer space? It really shouldn't work, but it does here. Uh, but I, I guess I should talk about the, the plot, just, um, down in general, um, trying not to spoil it. Uh, S.H.I.E.L.D., who is a black ops organization, kind of independent from a, the government, not quite CIA, not quite FBI, but something of a different bureau, and, uh, they, they are in charge with the welfare of the human race, pretty much. Mostly America, not all the time, but mostly. Um, and uh, they're led by Nick Fury, who's played by Samuel L. Jackson. Uh, he tells them that uh, basically the, the Tesseract, which is actually the Cosmic Cube, um, if anybody who doesn't know, because they didn't really explain it in Thor, but uh, the Tesseract Cube was a basically a large cube of power. He was almost like a light bulb in Asgard, which is uh, the ninth realm of uh, Idrisil, the, the 
the world's tree, which is, um, th there's nine realms, nine planets, basically, and, um, uh, Asgard is the highest of, uh, all beings, and we, as Midgard, are the lowest, <laughs> and, uh, somehow that cube came to Earth, we don't know how, yet, but, um, it was used in Captain America uh, to fund, to basically power the weapons of Hydra, which was a deep science provision of Nazi Germany, who uh, they, they found and now come to the modern age, and they're trying to find a way to harness the energy that's getting off to this cube. Unfortunately, you're trying to... Uh, harness the energy of basically what is magical and you're using it you're basically um, using technology that is so beneath that uh, I guess I could give an example like you're trying to make uh, clone a human through DNA with a toaster that's basically what's kind of what's going on and through this tesseract, tesseract that we know that is uh, through Thor, um, it uh, is a transport, and Loki comes into Earth, he uh, manipulates some people, he made some very shady bargains with uh, an alien race from a different realm, uh, and he's coming down to Earth in order to rule it, rule it in the, because he could not rule Asgard, his own home, and those who do not know Loki, he is, was raised as a son of Odin, Allfather, who is kind of the god of all gods. And he, unfortunately, has always been told throughout his life that only one, he or his brother, is uh, going to be king. But they were both born to rule. Unfortunately, throughout his entire life, he was told this, but he never got that chance. He was never really loved by his father. He was more of a mama's boy, and he always grew up in his older brother's shadow, and he, he threw, I guess I'll explain that later, but he um, grew jealous and bitter, and even though he loved his brother, went against his brother, and uh, he... Oh, I forgot where I was going with this, but but um, he tried to rule Asgard through in the movie of Thor and did it to the point where he could only be the rightful heir. Basically, manipulated his way into making everyone believe that he let go of Asgard, went off into an abyss. He dropped down to Earth, and this is where we go. And we're bringing all these heroes together from different films, uh, who are very much very different from each other, and with different personalities, and somehow bring them together <laughs> with uh, as much, mm, not as much alliance, I guess as much friends, no, they're not really friends, but um, with as much um, goals uh, as they could possibly could you know, yeah, let's save the Earth, yay! But, uh, and that's pretty much the Avengers. Now, I'm going to go down to spoiler territory, so if you don't want any uh, spoilers, please shut this part down, because I'm going to go through uh, all seven films that led to the Avengers, which I feel is very important, particularly with that very long explanation. Um, uh, but basically, go see it, and... Here's the rest of it. Now, let's go through... I'm going to go through Iron Man first. I know that the whole movies came out first. I'm highly aware of that. Problem is this. I will discuss them later. But uh, generally, most people kind of consider the start of the Avengers with the Hulk film uh, back in 2008. And I don't see it as that. Um, I saw it start really with Iron Man. Everyone compares all the other Marvel films with Iron Man. Everyone seems to acknowledge that this is kind of what really 
you really kind of got the point that the Avengers is coming those uh, five, six years ago uh, with Iron Man. So let's talk about that. Um, my personal, excuse me, about my phone, um, my personal opinion of it, I enjoyed the film. Uh, it's a great film. Does it have flaws? Of course. Uh, solid story, solid acting for the most part. Um, Robert Downey Jr., I've been a fan of his since the 80s. Uh, I guess since Weird Science, I think. And I was very much supportive of him through the 80s and even through his stint through the 90s where he was very irresponsible, high as a kite. And um, I really hoped that he pulled through that, and he did. And with that, I supported him through watching his films when he was clean and sober, and I am so proud of him for uh, getting up out of that giant spiral and somehow um, become basically a rock star in Hollywood. Uh, good for him. Excellent, excellent. He's It's very well worth it. And I was very surprised to hear when he um, was going to do a comic book movie, because I'm so used to him doing either, you know, back in the 80s he did a lot of teen comedies, in the 90s he did a lot of romantic comedies, by the 2000s he did a lot of drama. Yeah, he did Chaplin, but he did a lot of drama by that time, and uh, I'm so used to him being that kind of romantic character, the, 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 the dramatic asshole, the the geeky kid that I wasn't terribly sure if he could do comic book badass. That was a little weird to me and I was pleasantly surprised. Uh, excellent. He steals the show completely. He steals the entire film. Um, Pepper Potts, played by Gwyneth Paltrow, excellent. Um, I really, I really seem to love the relationship between Tony and Pepper, somewhere between flirtation and being completely serious, uh, professional relationship, and now with the Avengers it has now come full circle and has become a full-fledged dating kind of thing, um, a true love relationship, and I hope that lasts. Um, my biggest problem with the film was really Rhodey. Terrence Howard, while a really good actor, I, I admit he's a really good actor, I've seen his other works, he's very well done, but he seemed very bad as Rhodey. Let me give you an example. Every time Tony Stark goes into a scene, Rhodey is a pushover. He's constantly being bitched at by Tony, he's constantly being insulted by Tony, and he never kind of talks back, he kind of takes it. That's not Rhodey, that's not War Machine. That uh, he should never roll over for uh, Tony. Tony is the most irresponsible person on the planet. Please do not roll over <laughs> for him just because he's exceedingly charming. And uh, which I'm very happy that Pepper does not do that. But that Rhodey did. Uh, let's see, let's talk about the villain. Um, Oh, Obadiah Stane, who is played by Jeff Bridges. Jeff Bridges is one of those actors that I, I always seem to recognize him as Jeff Bridges, no matter what he does. I actually was pleasantly surprised that I could tell it was him, but he seemed to be very lost into the character, and I couldn't dissuade him from like other characters such as the dude or or from Tron or anything like that. Uh, he was a good villain. The problem is that fight was seven minutes? Maybe not even that? Maybe five? Um, I, I liked it. It was highly dramatic. It was wonderfully filmed, but it was not much of a climax. It kind of came off as very anticlimactic. Um, uh, I, I liked it, I mean, it worked for the film, but it seemed like we kind of, I kind of wanted in another maybe seven more minutes, maybe ten more minutes of 
that fight and um, it would have been nice, who knows, but uh, I, it makes up for the scene where Obadiah basically puts that little device against Tony's ear and just basically monologues, and that's a great monologue, I'll admit, and uh, that's a wonderful scene and that will make up with giant robots beating the shit out of each other, but uh, because it's very character driven. I'm a great lover of character-driven scenes. Um, let's go also to Iron Man 2. Now, despite my complaints with Terrence Howard, I love Don Chittle. Um, I'm actually a great fan of his work. I loved him in Hotel Rwanda. When people were uh, were kind of crapping over Don Chittle for getting the role of Rhodey because people had liked Terrence Howard. I, however, was one of those people who did not like him. Uh, I really wanted him to do it, and he did a brilliant job. I love him as Rhodey, and I loved him as War Machine. He was a guy who would not roll over to uh, Tony. He actually talked back. He insulted back, and he they actually came off more as equals, and I enjoyed that a great deal more. Uh, uh, Pepper, of course, is awesome, uh, we're over down to Judy's off. Whiplash. Now, Whiplash, everybody, a lot of people complained that he was an, an amalgamation between, uh, Whiplash and the Crimson Dynamo, and you know what? I don't care, because Crimson Dynamo always sucked. Um, yes, I've read the comics, and even though I'm more of a DC fan than a Marvel fan, I'm very, very familiar with Marvel. Uh, Crimson Dynamo is someone... If anybody who does not know his character, um, he is a character who was very much created from his time through the Cold War. He was a Soviet Union, yeah, USSR created uh, device in order to go against Tony, the all-American man, and uh, that doesn't work nowadays, you know? It, I don't know what the hell you would do other than maybe make him... I guess Afghan, but that that goes down to racism, and you really shouldn't do that, and uh, it doesn't work. So I'm actually very happy that they combined those two characters because Crimson Dynamo honestly sucks. I never liked the character. Whiplash, nice. Now it's a girl, but you know. <laughs> and um, for those who obviously didn't know, um, I guess I'm backtracking. Uh, who, maybe the 12 of you who don't know who Iron Man is, mm, he was a man, was a weapons, a war monger, he was a weapons dealer, a war profiteer, like his father, who is a combination of Howard Hughes, Einstein, Walt Disney, so, um, you know, billionaire, uh, the playboy, the inventor, the, 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 uh, the all-American uh, royalty, uh, the royal family of America, if we actually ever had one. And Tony was kind of like the prince, and we see him going through the changes as he sees his the weapons that he created to help U.S. soldiers end up killing them, and he ended up kidnapped, put into a cave, uh, a lot of people had said that how racist that was, but um, they were actually very sensitive about it. They talked that this was all the countries that were destroyed by Tony through his weapons. They weren't all Afghan, they were not all Muslim, they were not, no, some of them were Polish, some of them were um, Russian, some of them were, um, you know, from the Mediterranean. It was so many different languages. Uh, and... Uh, they were nice, subtle about it. They weren't racist about it, like most people said they were. So, um, I think people are really oversensitive now. But, um, he got out of that situation, um, and basically tried to become a nuclear deterrent, a peacemaker, and he did it mostly for his own ego, which is what Iron Man, everyone seems to love about Iron Man. He's style over substance, I suppose, and 
uh, it's a wonderful character. He's an asshole. He's uh, he's a guy that you would love to be at a party with. You probably don't want to know him in real life. So, um, and there's a lot of people like that. And he saves the world for kind of his own image, but kind of to do the right thing. Eventually, despite all his inconsistencies and all his um, his uh, ego trips and everything, generally Tony has to have someone there, some conscience, Pepper, Rhodey, someone in order to kind of push him into the superhero territory because honestly he wouldn't have done it without them. Um, some people have complained about Jarvis, which is played by Paul Benny. He's not the the butler. Instead, he's a computer program. You know, I like that. I never. I always thought uh, Jarvis was too Alfred Pennyworth from Batman, and really, he that's who they modeled him after. So, seeing that, uh, this is how I always saw it. Tony doesn't have friends, honestly. He is a guy who invented his own friends. He made his own friends through robots, and it, that made him really one of the loneliest people in the world, a man who had everything but really had nothing, and it really was exemplified through him having Dummy, and who was, um, people are uh, wondering if you actually see uh, the scene where he is before, where they're making a biography of him during the the award ceremony in the first film, you actually see Dummy as his first robot, and um, when you see Dummy now, he has all these um, different, uh, like he's been updated and upgraded so many times, and uh, and it never seems to quite work, but you, you don't think that Tony would be so sympathetic to an old robot, but I guess that was really his first real friend, and you don't get rid of your first friend, um, and, uh, that was, you really told a lot about his character without really saying anything, and I'm a, I'm a person who's very analytical about films, so, uh, recommend the film, I liked it, Iron Man 2, uh, do I have problems with it, I have more problems with it than I do with Iron Man 1, one, um, I liked half of the film, the other half, I can't say I liked, and it's kind of like, okay, I liked, okay, how do I explain how I liked the first film, the second film? Second film, I loved the first act, second act was very strange, third act, half of it was great, <laughs> and uh, I think it's mainly because they try to shoehorn the Black Widow, and, um, and Nick Fury, and while I really love Nick Fury scenes, like the brother just walked in there and took your suit, uh, but the Black Widow, uh, she was kind of there, and then she was kind of out of the picture, and then she came back, and it just kind of came off as really weird. Another thing about uh, Iron Man 2 that, while I love the villain, uh, Michael, uh, sorry, not Michael, Mickey Rourke, who actually had a very similar personal life to Robert Downey Jr., a uh, man who kind of had everything and then lost it through drugs and then came back. Um, he... I, I do like Iron Man too, but it's um, very flawed. It uh, kind of comes off as jarring because the um, addition of the, the shield thing. Uh, another thing that I, I seem to have really hated because I didn't like the way they used the character was Coulson. I am a huge fan of Coulson. He's my second favorite character throughout these Marvel movies and he kind of comes in and then disappears and uh, I know but but um, while he was used actually very well in the first movie uh, you didn't get to know him too well. In the second movie he has a witty line and then just kind of disappears and I kind of wanted him to stay, and I didn't know why Black Widow was really there. I kind of liked her as a secretary, and then she just does stuff. It's pretty. Yay. Um, 
Nick Fury more substantial. I didn't like that Howard Stark basically created his own element and stuck it into basically Tomorrowland. So I that's silly and stupid and never like that. And for that reason, Iron Man 2 is not my least favorite, but it's certainly one that I I watched the least. Seeing the okay, going to the maturity of the character of Tony Stark through Avengers. Now talking about these films, um, Tony is very much the same. He's I, I guess seasoned now. I, I seem to feel that in Avengers he's much more mature. Not a lot, but he's a little. Um, I think this goes to the fact that he is dating Pepper now. And she is settling him, I guess. I hate that to say that, that he's, she's changing him, because she's not. She's, um, he seems a little wiser now. Seems a little more uh, easier to get along with. Um, and uh, one thing I did like that was in The Avengers is seeing Tony go from the playboy, going from a woman on every poor woman every night, probably didn't know her name, didn't know if she was blonde or brunette or anything like that. You have finally Tony in a stable-ish relationship, and he's enjoying it, actually, and it almost comes off as he's finally growing up. I like that. It's nice to finally see him grow up. Um, I'm not sure how this is going to react to Iron Man 3. And if everybody hasn't um, checked uh, the news yet, um, Ben Kingsley, Sir Ben Kingsley, excuse me, uh, has been cast as a villain. We don't know which villain. I assume the, the Manchurian, but he was kind of in the first film as the leader of the Ten Rings, so I don't know. Uh, whatever it's going to be, he's probably going to be awesome, because I love Ben Kingsley, Oscar winner, of course, and not that he hasn't had his hammy moments, um, but, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be there. Um, I guess then I should talk about Thor. Thor. Um, Thor is a film a lot of people seem to hate. I adore the film. And I adore the film mostly because of its flaws. Uh, I, I, I admit it's a very imperfect film. Uh, I, I do have a great deal of problems with it. Mainly because the deleted scenes. S three deleted scenes. If you have the Blu-ray edition or um, have YouTube, go look up pre-coordination scene. The, the, I think it's called dumb dumb scene or Ron Rumson scene I don't know I just call it the extended um, the I call it the extended table flipping scene so and the other one is Loki is King these scenes should have been in the film and they were removed for time I hate the fact that time plays such a huge role in films if you're gonna do a story say it don't worry about time um, say the story that you need to say. Don't worry if it's an hour and a half or two hours and a half, two and a half hours or even three. Just say the story you're going to say. Don't Please don't censor it. That was my biggest problem with Thor, that there were so many scenes that needed to be in and were left out. Um, let's talk about um, what it's about. Um, Obviously, you have uh, Thor, the god of thunder, is going to be coordinated as heir to Asgard, which is the ninth realm, the highest realm of uh, Idrisil. And um, he was going to be crowned this by Odin, his own father. He is the golden boy. He is the, he is, uh, the, the one, he's the daddy's little boy. Um, unfortunately, Thor is also arrogant. Uh, he is self-possessed, he is extremely egotistical, he um, needs a big giant 
kick in the behind and um, and really needs to be slapped once in a while. <laughs> and um, while I love the character Thor, I like him, Chris Hemsworth in the role. It's nice to actually see him throughout the journey of Thor learn humility, uh, learn to care more about your friends, learn not to endanger them, not to um, to say that um, the world does not revolve around you just because you are the son of all father and, and I like that um, seeing his journey come from starting a war between the, the, the frost giants and the Asgardians basically through pure arrogance and ego and seeing him fall down to earth become mortal try to get his hammer back he can't and basically almost become resolved in to be permanently become human and then his friends are rescue him and saying that he's the only one who can defeat his brother Loki. Loki is really a great villain in this and I hate to say that he's a villain because he's the most misunderstood character of all time. Um, here's a character, I, what I love, okay, I guess what a lot of people did not like about Thor is because it's so Shakespearean. I'm a great lover of Shakespeare. I uh, I've, anal I've analyzed it, I've um, written on the subject, I've, I've done essays on the subject. Uh, I love Shakespeare, I don't see what's wrong with that. I guess the average viewer does not get it, you know. Um, they saw Thor and they thought it was very strange that, you know, you're in this world and then all of a sudden you're on Earth and then you go back into that world. You know, what is this world? And I kind of get what they're saying. I, I get that it seems very broad, but that's my love for melodrama and that's my love for Shakespeare, and I love that crap, man. I, I adore it. I, I just, the scene where um, you have uh, Odin come, come to Thor and he goes, you are a cruel, uh, ungrateful boy, and all of a sudden, you are a old man and a fool. I love that. Um, you know, you're just yelling at um, uh, the king. Uh, what is so Shakespearean about it is, I can't say that it's a stereotype because honestly there's no Shakespearean play that really is that similar to Thor. It's um, the story of royalty. You have the king, the queen, and the two brothers. Two brothers who love each other but also are very one is very jealous of the other, uh, the other is very arrogant or very stupid not to know that his brother is after him. Uh, you have the younger brother as the as someone who always got pushed down, someone who always was trying to get attention and never got it, someone who was always trying to please their father and never getting it. And I understand Loki, or a lot of people would understand Loki for that reason. He is um, constantly second best if uh, he, he, for that reason, attached to his mother, which you can see in the deleted scenes, uh, rather than his father. And then you learn that his father is not his father. He's actually the son of his father's enemy, uh, which is uh, Lafi, the... The, the frost king of the frost giants and he was abandoned by the frost giants because he was weak and he was taken over by taken by Odin adopted and throughout his life thought he was an Asgardian and then you realize throughout your entire life you are fed these stories that oh frost giants are evil frost giants or are savage frost giants or will eat your toes while you are sleeping in bed that type of thing, then you find out you are that, how absolutely betrayed you would feel that, um, that, uh, that you are one of the boogeymen, that you were the, that little story that your parents told you, and that you are a monster, practically, so, and one of the main things that was very difficult is Odin going into the Odin sleep. Now, the Odin sleep 
go watch Loki is King deleted scene. It explained it all right there in a 10 second scene, which was a scene that was lasted four minutes, five minutes, which I don't understand why that could not be added in. And, um, I understand, but well, I can see why the pre-coordination scene is... Really, I just wanted two scenes in. Three scenes I would have been probably most happy with, but two scenes I really, really wanted. I wanted the extended uh, scene with the table flipping and then uh, Loki coming in and becoming basically Iago from Othello, whispering in Odin's ear. And I think people misunderstand that Loki wanted... was basically a, kind of like a one-note villain. Again, he wasn't. Loki never wanted to be king. That's very clear in the deleted scenes. All he wanted was to be the equal. He just wanted to be treated fairly, and he never got it. He just wanted a chance, which he never got. Uh, he loves Thor as a brother, obviously. He cares for him deeply, but um, I think Tom Hilston, the actor who plays him, said it better that the, the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. The fact that you can say that you don't care when you truly do, that makes you do very horrible things. Like, oh yeah, I don't care about my brother. Oh, what if he dies? Oh, what if I did something that supposedly hurt? No, nah, it doesn't matter. That's more than just saying, oh, I hate him. I'm going to do everything in my power to bring him down. That's not what Loki's doing. Loki is trying to do what he can to really, to really set himself apart from his brother, to set himself that he can rule just as equally as his brother. And he schemed for this matter to bring his biological father into it and try to kill Odin and then make up this entire thing that he this man, this murderer comes in and Loki saves him I am a worthy son I uh, did this for you, you know, I love you blah 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 that's a really good plan <laughs> um, uh, one of the things I guess I really disliked about uh, Thor is the destroyer, I really hate the destroyer nobody knows, unless you read the comics, you don't know what the hell a destroyer is. Uh, they don't even explain it in the deleted scenes, they don't explain it in the film. Really, it's really uh, the enchanted armor of Odin. How Odin can fit in that, I don't know. But, um, it was the, the guardian of uh, the relics, and he is summoned when Odin cannot come down to Earth himself. And with Odin asleep, Loki takes over, and he takes over the Destroyer, and I, I can see why they did it. They wanted to make sure they brought in all the, the fight between Loki and Odin, not on Earth. They wanted to keep it in Asgard. They didn't want him to go down, because that's the Avengers, seeing him go down in Avengers. Um, now let's talk about the relation between Thor and the Avengers. Um, Loki is one of the most complex characters. I, I, he is my favorite character because I really, you really relate to him. You feel that he is the, the lost prince in, in Thor. He is, he doesn't know who he is. Once he finds out, he definitely doesn't know who he is. He doesn't know why he's here. What's his purpose? Why does he meet? Why does he exist? What is my mission in life? He doesn't know. He has, he's so, he doubts himself so much. And then when you go to Avengers, he knows exactly who he is. He knows exactly what he's capable of. And he knows exactly what he wants. He wants to rule, if he can't rule in Asgard, he's going to rule in Midgard. And he, as a villain, doesn't, perceive himself as a villain. He sees himself as the good guy. He sees him he sees himself as I'm the one who will bring order into chaos, even though he's a god of chaos. Um he he's going to bring 
his sort of order. Um, humans are selfish, bitter, vile creatures who can't make peace with themselves. Now, if I was a ruler, I can stop war. I can stop hunger. I can stop all this as long as they kneel to me. And that's kind of how his waggy little mind works. Thor sadly doesn't have a lot of scenes in it, and what scenes he does have is really good. Um, I, I wish they added more to the relationship between Thor and Loki, but the, 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 the rivalry between the two is so palpable in, in the Avengers that you really want more, and I have a feeling that that's going to happen in the deleted scenes in Avengers, that we're going to see all these new scenes that should be in there due to, um, uh, due to time constraints that you couldn't add it in. Um, that's kind of how I felt with Thor and I was right. And um, we have that. Uh, okay. So. <laughs> excuse me. But with that coming in, well, it's kind of sad that we don't see Odin in the Avengers, but obviously. Okay, I'm going to do spoiler, of course, but this is all spoilers. But um, Loki is, of course, captured in the end, and um, you see this uh, scene where they both have the this box with the Tesseract in there, and Thor holds one end, and Loki basically holds another end and twists it. Basically, it's almost like you see in his eyes. You can see there's all this hate in his eyes and bitterness, but and he's also, he can't talk. He has a, a gag on, which is, um, uh, anyone who doesn't know the Norse mythology, uh, Loki at one point had his lips sewn together by dwarves. Um, if nobody knows that legend, it's, um, he basically had a bargain with dwarves, and he broke that bargain, and dwarves, uh, their punishment was that if you could not if you lost, we take your head. And Loki is like, well, you can't take my head because it's attached to my neck. You have to kill, chop my neck. Neck's not part of the bargain. So instead they sewed his uh, mouth shut for per, to prevent him from telling lies. And um, while and it was enchanted, he nobody could uh, release him from that except I think it was his wife, or it was Odin himself that did that. So, but he he was locked like that for some time, and um, that was really nice little thing. But um, with Thor two coming out, I really hope maybe in the end we can see his lips get sued because it's um I think I'm just thinking about what it could do to his character. Um, I'm thinking about the amount of psychological damage. That it could do to his character, and um, someone with almost like a post-traumatic stress disorder, almost like it's almost um, it's such abuse and torture that you know these are the people who raised you, and all of a sudden you're they're sewing your lips together, and that would be nice. I'd like to see that. And there's in that scene where he he's basically almost resolute on coming home. Loki, that is, uh, when he brings the Tesseract and they go back to Asgard. And basically that leaves off to Thor 2. Um, I liked in the Avengers, they talk about Jane Foster. Now, let's talk about Jane Foster for a second here. Um, I like, uh, uh God, what's her name? Um, uh, do, 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 do. While I like uh, Natalie Portman, excuse me, as Jane Foster, I like her. The problem is that Jane Foster originally was very boring in the comics, and um, in the animated uh, Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes, the Jane is a, a, a an EM. Basically, an ambulance, an ambulance doctor, medic, and um, there's a scene in the first episode where 
for basically questions are why do you you're so weak and you're so puny why would you want to save the lives of people who are so fragile and Jane just basically says because it's right because it's my duty and because I value human life that's nice um, I like that um, uh, in Thor she was an astrophysicist basically who was very much um, obsessed in trying to get wormholes basically trying to prove them that they exist which is um, through the Bifrost and through the conservatory you can travel through different realms basically that's a wormhole and um, I understand where they were going with the character where they were trying to make her as arrogant and self-absorbed as Thor and then in the end she learns humility and didn't quite come out that way and maybe it's due to Natalie Portman's performance. I like her, but she has done bad films. Take, for example, Star Wars. She was not good in that. No matter how pretty she was, she wasn't. Can she make bad movies? Yes, anyone can. And, um, and I felt that her performance was very lacking. Um, one, she always, she always looks like she's 12, and Chris Hemsworth, Chris Hemsworth definitely looks 30, well, he's technically like 25, I think, um, but, um, 28, I think, and, um, congratulations on him for, um, about to get a new baby, by the way, and he... It just didn't seem like a good match. Maybe because I liked um, the the girl who played uh, Jane's friend, um, Kate Dennings, as Darcy Lewis, and she was kind of a co-worker of Jane's, although they didn't really say anything like that. I always kind of, for the longest time, I figured that she was the daughter of, like, Selznick, the... the um, the other doctor, and, um, uh, Eric Silva is played by Stillian Skarsgård, I can't pronounce your name, I'm sorry if I say it wrong, but, um, I always thought that, she, that Darcy was his daughter, but it wasn't, and if she's a political science major, were they sisters? I, that I didn't understand quite the relationship, and that was another thing I, really disliked about Thor. Um, I, I could not figure out the relationships were not as defined as it was in Asgard. On Earth it was very strange. <laughs> um, uh, and I, I, while I'm glad that they mention her, I almost wish that she was replaced rather like um, Terrence Howard with uh, Don Chilly. I, I, I like Kate Kat uh, Diddings more. I don't think she could have done a better Jane than Natalie Portman, despite her multiple awards. She, I, I, I like her, but she kind of has a habit of playing the same character. Um, that's pretty much my my thing with that. And with Thor two coming out, apparently uh, Loki is going to return. Awesome. There's going to be a new villain. We don't know who it is. I hope it's Amora, the Enchantress, because that would be awesome. I hope uh, Sinya, which is Loki's wife, makes an appearance because I'm a. I love the way fans have portrayed her. Um, it sounds really stupid, but she's stupid in the comics. She really is, and um, I really would like some. Villains need love too, <laughs> so I kind of hope that, that that happens, and um, it'd be really nice to see more of the Enchantress and the Executioner. Um, I really hope they, they cast that one well, because sadly not many women out here in Hollywood can look pretty and act at the same time. Sad but true. But, let's... <laughs> 
God, I wish I was in classic Hollywood again. Anyway, but that's pretty much what I'm going to say with Thor. Um, the next one was going to be Captain America, the first Avenger. I was one of those people who was really much against Chris Evans because I, I knew him from his romantic comedies and I knew him from the Fantastic Four movies, which were horrible, horrible movies, and he was horrible in that. And usually he's very horrible in his romantic comedies. Um, I, I did not see him as the all-American guy. And um, I guess you could say that Captain America is just... Captain America is one of the most difficult characters to portray because he has to be so many things. He has to be humble. And he has to be uh, heroic and... Uh, the, the, the icon, the legend. He's supposed to be out of touch with humanity. He's supposed to be the, the Boy Scout. He's supposed to be, you know, basically a Superman thing. So, um, but you can make that so wrong by making him the... Because he should be the boy from Brooklyn before he was a soldier. And a lot of people make him the soldier first. And he's a guy I can't see swear at all. You know, if that man's stubbed his foot somehow, he would say, oh, crikey, so, oh, man, so, uh, you know, you wouldn't say damn or shit or anything like that, he's just, just a guy that would do something like that, because it's Steve Rogers, um, I can't see him say hell or damn or anything like that, he's just one of those characters that always seems out of sorts if he did that, if you make him too gritty, it doesn't work, uh, and it's a very complex character to really, even though he's a simple character, he's complex to portray correctly. A lot of people have portrayed him incorrectly. Um, uh, let me think of, a lot of people, um, in the comics kind of exasperate his, um, how out of touch he is. Oh, he doesn't know how to use the internet. Oh, you're so out of touch. What? You know, my mom knows how to use the internet. My grandmother, sort of. <laughs> so, um, doesn't mean that she's out of touch at all. And, and another to see, you know, people are, yeah, times have changed, but humanity hasn't really changed that much. Um, and that should be what should be portrayed. And I didn't think Chris Hemsworth had the chops to do that. And I was pleasantly surprised by um, what he did in Captain America and um because you could do it so wrong if I um, think uh, so, uh the Red Brown series just recently came on DVD uh the two Red Brown um, Captain America movies man that's bad <laughs> so uh I think it just came out this year and I bought it and I watched it and it's bad and I remember the the old 40s serials uh, from the films and the, how bad those were and just as bad as Superman versus the mole people and Batman versus the the Japs, the Japanese <laughs> Japanese mad scientists and all those wonderful 40s and 30s serials that uh, you ever get a chance to watch and um uh <laughs> poor Steve I guess I should also talk about uh, the, I, I, the plots. Um, I adore Skinny Steve. I think it's a great character. Um, people are wondering, like, is it different from Big Steve? Yes, it is, actually. It is a very different character, and um, they should mature uh, from Big Steve to Little Steve, but it always kind of came off as totally different character because Skinny Steve has these experiences while Big Steve has these others. And of course they're played primarily by Chris Evans who did a great job and uh, body double as well as CGI and all that stuff and clever camera angles. Um, they did a great job and I have the Blu-ray edition so um, you think that as a person who has worked in 3D, person who has worked in film and animation, I can kind of see it. 
It's very, very light, but the average person probably couldn't see it. Um, me, I'm trained to see it, so I can see it at times. Not all the time, but at times. Um, it's really obvious in the, in the, the scene where the, the where they go to the Stark Expo, well not the World's Fair I guess, World's Fair which was kind of like the Stark's Ex Expo, and they go into the U.S. Uh, military facility where you get tested, and he um, goes to Bucky and he says that he doesn't want to get scrap metal and all that. You can actually see kind of the outline of uh, how, how they did the CGI. I can see it, I don't know if you can see it, but Check it out and see if you can locate kind of the scenes. Um, but uh, he did a surprisingly good job. Peggy was wonderful. Um, uh, anything that comes out of the mouth of Tommy Lee Jones is awesome, for the most part. Not including, well, Two-Face had a couple of good lines. But, um, uh, uh, but you know, he, he did a fantastic job and he plays Tommy Lee Jones. With that role, you can't play anyone else. Um, Red Skull. Now, with Hugo Weaving, while I admire him as an actor, he does have a camp value. You kind of have to get used to that. Uh, I remember the days when he did not have that, so, um, like the interview and the, the this is before, kind of like Priscilla, Queen of the Desert kind of thing, and uh, he was a very serious character, and somehow he got from this to Lord of the Rings to Fever Vendetta to Red Skull, and um, fun, you know, character. Uh, not who I wanted as Red Skull originally. I forgot who I wanted, but um, I originally wanted um. Uh, Hugo Weaving to be Sinestro for the new, well, not the new, but <laughs> for the previously new Green Lantern film, and um, I was actually really surprised that he was Red Skull and he wouldn't be playing Sinestro. So, um, who was, you know, one of my favorite villains, anyway, going back to Marvel. Uh, it's bizarre to see this works so well. I, um, I didn't expect it to be as emotional as it was. I didn't expect to enjoy the characters as much as who I was, mainly because while Captain America is a simple character, he's a vanilla character, he's a complex to, to, um, to, to portray. He is relatively a boring character. Um, you can make him interesting by making the situation interesting and seeing how putting him through situations that he's never been before, and that's what they did. Did a great job. Um, Captain America in Avengers, hmm, yes, he's been on. Yes, he's out of touch. Yes, the costume actually looks better, with the exception of the helmet. Kind of missed the little pit helmet. But, um, for the most part, he's very nice. And he, I was actually kind of amazed to see him, uh, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Robert Downey Jr. and keep his own. That's hard to do with uh, someone as uh, as uh, elite as Robert Downey Jr. You somehow are able to act on that same plane. That takes talent. That's hard to do. Um, that's um, That was actually surprising. And what I always loved about characters of Tony and Steve is that they're basically an old married couple. They bicker like crazy. They are so different. And they show bicker, 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 and they do. And it's nice to see them work together. And uh, kind of get apart their differences and, and, and do that because Tony is a guy who has to be pushed to do something while um, Steve is someone who will do it out of duty. You just have to tell him once. Um, while well, you have to tell Tony maybe three or fourteen times, so, 
Um, so, yeah. Uh, the next up, I should talk about the Hulk films. I'm um, leaving those last now. Yes, there are different actors in those films. Yes, most people don't include the Ang Lee version, the Hulk, compared to the Incredible Hulk. I kind of consider them the same. They're very different. I admit one is more, the first one was more dramatic, while the other one was more action-packed. One of them had, I forgot the guy's name, but, um, oh, let me check oh, what the guy's name is. Oh, da -da 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 -da, Eric Bana. Oh, God, he was boring. <laughs> and Edward Norton. Okay, I'm going to do a little confession. I like Edward Norton, but he plays the same exact character all the time. And he's good at that. Um, he can do variations of that same character, but it's still Edward Norton. And sadly, it's Edward Norton. <laughs> so, um... That's my biggest problem with the new one is it's boring and he, while you look like he did a good job and it's not a good film but still he did it and he did okay in it and I'm just saying okay. It could be due to the fact that the script was so bad. It could be the fact that he kind of just said I don't feel like acting today. Um, it could be something like that, but why a lot of people were so disappointed that he would not come back, and the reasons behind that have been debated, say, some saying that he was very difficult to work with, some say that he didn't want to do it, some say he did want to do it, some say that Marvel just simply did not want him back. Um, whatever the reason, I'm actually kind of glad they didn't pick him for some odd reason, because he would not work on this. Edward Norton doesn't have the talent or the chops to really go against Robert Downey Jr. Or, or Tom Hiddleston or Chris Evans, strangely enough. Um, Chris Hemsworth um, does not have the chops. Um, Mark Ruffalo, I'll have to admit, is amazing as the Hulk, as Banner, and he's amazing as Hulk. Here's the one thing I've always hated about the two Hulk films. The Hulk is the same. It's the same. They never looked like the actor. It just looked like Hulk from the comic. While people might like that, you it's still essentially the same person. And you could say, like, oh, the animation was horrible. Yes, I know the animation was horrible, but that's not really the point. The point is, can they do a character? Because you can watch old films with old special effects, whether they're old CGI or or claim or uh, stop motion, and still say, yes, was that effective? Was it effective in the Hulk? No. Was it effective in the Incredible Hulk? No. Um, it was better in the Incredible Hulk, but it wasn't. Can you portray emotion in that? that sense. No. Could you kind of portray what's going on? Sort of. You, um, that was kind of like one of the biggest problems I had is that it was too, I guess I liked the first Hulk a little better. I enjoyed the, 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 the dramaticness of it while I hated the performance of Eric Bana. The first one, yeah, it had more action, but it was so plotless, and um, I enjoyed the acting more, but it was still, you know, nice, okay acting with really bad story. So, then you have Mark Ruffalo, who is a very seasoned veteran actor, um, remember him in All the King's Men. Uh, I remember seeing his butt somewhere in one film. I don't remember what it was, but uh, uh, but he he's actually a great actor. And if you ever haven't seen his work, I highly recommend it. Um, he's one of those actors you can't really tell Tim. And his Bruce Banner, I have to say, 
He's great. I wanted to hug that man. I, and the Hulk is actually my least favorite character, um, when it comes to the comics, because he's also a character that has been done very badly by writers. Some people want to do just the action, that's not the point of the Hulk. Some people do too much drama, that's not enough. And you have to have a happy compliment between the two, and Mark Ruffalo does a great job. One, I'm very actually very happy that the Hulk actually looks like him, because it means a lot, and it actually gives a wonderful expression that you could tell it's him, but you could tell that um, the brain, the eyes are different, and it really just gives that so much more life. And while... Um, Mark Ruffalo looks like a character who's been through hell. Now, those who don't know the Hulk, he was a character that his anger was stemmed from physical abuse by his, I think his, I believe it's a drunk, drunk alcoholic father. And um, there was some insinuations that he might have been sexually abused. Some people might disagree with that, but that's kind of how I always saw it with the way that he was retconned. It always seemed like, yeah, he got abused by his father. He took the brunt of it from his mother and his... I think he had sister. I think he did. I'm not sure. It's been a long while since I've seen it or read it. And um, he... All that anger inside him. And then you have a person who actually looks quite young. And yet he still has that little bit of white in his hair. Kind of like a constantly stressed, constantly been through hell, constantly seen the world at its worst, who's lived the world at its worst, and it's actually really nice that they build up the Hulk. They do not um, make the Hulk just come out in the first act. It actually comes out in the second act, and the way they did it is um, they practically made the Hulk fall down several stories and hit something, and unfortunately, while Tony could not get the Hulk, get um, Banner to become the Hulk by annoying him. He, unfortunately, it happened through more of an accident. Um, that works. That's how you do the character. You don't, you, I hate to say compared to Michael Bay, but a lot of people have been comparing the Avengers to Michael Bay. But Michael Bay has this habit of making a character go into the action very quickly and then staying in that moment. The Avengers doesn't do that. Uh, the Hulk doesn't do that in the Avengers. The Hulk should be... You have to be able to keep that character... You have to keep Banner as much as possible and then show the Hulk at the best possible moment and then bring him out and basically almost let him disappear and then bring him out again. And he only turns into Hulk twice. I like that. Um, it's actually, oh, 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 oh. Uh, it's actually very nice uh, because it really gives you the most. You really want to know Banner and then you want the Hulk to come out during the most opportune times, which is really when the Helicar carrier is being broken into. And at the end with uh, the battle, the climax, that, those are two of the best part places to put the hole. That's how you should do it. Good job. And Bruce Banner, I, 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 I love this line that he did where he said that he felt really low at one point and tried to shoot himself. He put a gun into his mouth and pulled the trigger and the other guy, the Hulk, spit it out. He tried to kill himself. I, and I like that. Uh, I felt that the first two Hulk films, they um, they concentrated too much on trying to find a cure. Uh, when really it wasn't, shouldn't be a cure. And I like that this Hulk, however, doesn't seem to want a cure. He knows that there isn't a cure. And he's almost burdened by the fact that he can't find that. And he is trying to control his anger, his control of stress, 
um, and yet he's working in a very stressful environment when they finally found him in Calcutta, which people have been, I have recently read that people are saying that the Calcutta scene is racist because it shows slums in India, I guess, <laughs> and, and people are saying that, oh, that's racist, that's showing, you know, class abuse and whatever, and, you know, you know, people calm down. It's, um, there's a lot of third world countries out there who are a lot worse than America, and while you should help them, you should also know that there are people out there living on the streets here in America, too. You know, help them. So, uh, it's, um, these are people who could not afford a doctor, so Banner took it upon himself to become their doctor, doctor who can only be paid a small amount, and he seemed kind of in peace with this, or at least he seemed tranquil with the idea that he he is in this. And there's a wonderful scene in the beginning where you thought that the Hulk would come out, and you see a glimmer of it, like in his eyes, where uh, Natasha Romanoff, uh, which is Black Widow, comes into Calcutta and traps him in, a, in the edge of the city, and she says, I think there's nobody there, and he says, so we're all alone, and he goes, don't lie to me, and you just see this flash of the Hulk in his eyes, and then all of a sudden he snaps back, to Banner goes, I'm sorry, that was really mean to me, that was a wonderful fake out, I actually jumped back in my seat, when I saw that, I'm like, oh, God, it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen, and uh, it didn't. And that really built up to the second act, when the Hulk did come out, and then the third act, when he did come out. And um, you uh, and what I enjoyed about it is that the second act, it was an accident. Third act, it was on purpose. That's nice. Um, it really gives us a little more uh, brain on that. Um, what I'm saying basically is that Mark Ruffalo did a better job than Edward Norton and Eric Bannon, and uh, he should stay as the Hulk. And I'm told that he has now been signed up in a contract for Marvel for five more films. Now, while you have a contract for five more films, doesn't mean that you will make all five. Same as Tom Hiddleston as Loki, he is set up for six more films. And we don't know if the franchise will last that long, but we're hoping. And uh, so far they're doing a great job. And I would actually like to see Mark Ruffalo do a solo Hulk film. And finally it's, you know, done right. It took three films to find the right guy, and I hope he stays. And I, I actually kind of like the fact that he's a little older, and he's almost... Uh, a lot of people have been complaining about the ages. You you kind of have basically Captain America as a 23-year-old almost. Uh, he almost looks 18 uh, at times. Um, I know that he's 26, 25 in this movie. That Chris Hemsworth looks about 30, even though he's 28, 29. Um, Obviously, uh, you have uh, Iron Man, who's about to get on 50. Uh, he's about 48 now. And you have uh, Loki, who actually... <laughs> the actor is actually older than Chris Hemsworth, Tom Hiddleston. Uh, he's actually older than the older brother, which uh, I find ironic, but not by much. There, there's not much of an age difference. But uh, he's now my age now, 31. Yeah, no, we're born the same year. And uh, you have now Mark Ruffalo, who I, I'm not really sure, I haven't checked how old he is yet, but I believe, I, I'd like to say that he's 40-ish. Um, so it's kind of a nice compliment between kind of like the Iron Man age to kind of the Captain America age and the Thor age, and um, that's nice. And... Uh, I hope he does more films, and I uh, hope Iron Man 3 does well, and I, 
I hope that this Hulk film finally does it right, like the Avengers, and um, uh, I hope it does well. Um, here's, um, now that I've talked about those films, let's get back to the Avengers as a good talking to spoiler territory. And, um, <laughs> things I liked about it and things I hated about it, and I'm going both as a comic book fan and as a person who loves films and a person who watches comic book films. Um, I guess um, people are, are very critical when it comes to comic book films saying that it's lowbrow entertainment, and it's not. Um, you have two sides of comic book films. You have really, really campy, kind of like um, Batman and Robin territory, or Spider-Man territory, which was really camp, to ultra serious, which is the Christopher Nolan films, and maybe the Punisher films, and uh, it's, um, you have that wide range, and somehow Avengers kind of meets you somewhere in the middle. It's, uh, it's campy, but it's serious. It's, uh, that... It doesn't insult your intelligence like Transformers, but it's fun, and it's people who love action films will love it, people who love comic films would love it, people who love comedy would love it, people who love kind of drama would love it, which is kind of me, and um, people who just kind of enjoy films will enjoy it. That's, it's um, hard to find a film that complements all that, and while uh, I'll give uh, the other. Uh, uh, I guess I should talk about also the the characters who have been throughout these uh, six, seven films, and uh, should be noted should be Agent Coulson and of uh, which is played by Clark Gregg and Samuel L. Jackson is playing Nick Fury. Those who do not know, uh, Nick Fury, the one that. Samuel L. Jackson plays. This is Ultimate Nick Fury. Now, those who don't know what Ultimate is, basically Marvel Comics has their own separate universe. Uh, they had their own, basically kind of like their response to Crisis on Infinite Earths with um, DC Comics, where they kind of changed everything, and then created another alternate universe, which is more complementary to modern modern tastes, I suppose, since many of these comics have been around since um, the 60s, and obviously if you have a character like Iron Man, who was like 40 somewhere in the 60s, somehow become still 40 during the, the 2000s, excuse me, uh, that's a really hard thing to do. So they created the Ultimates uh, universe, which luckily, unlike Crisis on Infinite Earths and unlike the the newest um, DC reboot, New 52 BS, that's happened. Um, the Ultimate is actually a completely separate universe, so you can read mainstream Earth 616, I think that's what it's called, 616, which is modern day, and then you have the alternate universe, the Ultimates. And um, is the Ultimates good? Not really. Um, they, they started creating new characters and started killing off old characters. I mean, they killed off Nightcrawler, and, uh, the hell, man? <laughs> it's a, you killed off Beast, and you killed off Steak, and you started killing off like, Nito, and then you started killing off Savior, and well, he was already been dead, but, um, you know what I mean. And it's just, so they can just make way with this new, uh, breed of mutants, or a new breed of heroes, and it just doesn't typically work. Now, what has done well? Ultimate Nick Fury is actually really cool. I, uh, this is a character who's been around since, oh god, 40s? I mean, he started off as a military man, just like a war comic, and then started going to S.H.I.E.L.D., which is more of the 60s, and, and then it started by the 2000, well, the early 2000s, 
possibly very, 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 very late 90s, you had Ultimate Nick, Nick Fury and everybody who they actually asked uh, the permission of Samuel L. Jackson to use his likeness for Ultimate Nick Fury, and he, being a comic book fan, said yes. And so everybody was really wanting Samuel L. Jackson to play Nick Fury, and that man is uh, very old for the part, but he does a great job, and a uh, wonderful, wonderful job. And Coulson, my second favorite character, who was actually created for this Marvel franchise, the Marvel movie franchise, it was created by John Farrow, who was the director of the first Iron Man, and the second Iron Man. He created this character as kind of a a go-between throughout the movies, and though it didn't start out that way, the actor who plays him, uh, Greg, uh, Clark Greg, um, started off with Iron Man and did not realize he was going to do Iron Man 2, and then did not realize he's doing Thor and did not realize he was going to be in the Avengers, and uh, it was kind of a, a character that became a fan favorite, and he was that go-between guy, and while I did wish that he was in Captain America, um, uh, I think that I would love to have seen him in the background of New York Times Square, or I would have, instead of that female nurse that comes out in the end, I would have liked to see Coulson in 1930s gear. That would have been nice. And I uh, had him instead, rather than the pretty nurse that somehow looks like Peggy. So, uh, and, um, and just kind of bring him out that way. I thought the female nurse was really, really strange because she kind of disappears and goes away. But, uh, and for those who do not know, uh, I am going to go into spoiler territory now. He dies in the Avengers, and it is, I cried like no tomorrow. Uh, when it's, I was actually in my Loki costume, too. <laughs> I was at midnight screening at the Studio Movie Grill, and I was uh, second place at the costume contest since it was being sponsored by a local comic book store. And uh, we bought early, I bought early tickets, and a friend and I went, um, made a Loki costume, and got there one second place, and then next thing I know, <laughs> watching the Avengers film, all of a sudden, Loki kills Agent Coulson. I'm like, no! <laughs> Coulson! I'm like, um, uh, and, and it's, it was really, really sad, and I felt almost guilty wearing my Loki costume there, um, seeing what happened to him, and, uh, uh, da, 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 da. Uh, very sad scene. Was not expecting that scene, but I got why that happens. And those who do not know, Joss Whedon loves kill off characters, and be sure never to tell him who your favorite character is, because there's a good chance he'll kill him off, uh, or hit him or her off. And uh, Adrian Coulson was second favorite of mine, and he was killed off. And I get why he was, because he had a connection to every. Avenger, and his death basically brought the entire Avengers initiative together, and I uh, hate to see him as a, a woman in the refrigerator, but I get why they did that, and I also, surprisingly, he's uh, the Nick Fury, there's a scene where um, Kobe Smulders, uh, uh character, which is Mar Agent Marn Hill, comes up to him saying that uh, the Captain America cards were not on Coulson's person, not in his jacket, they were actually in his locker, and he, uh, Fury lied saying that it was on his person because it would give him that extra, the Avengers, that extra push in order to get somewhere, in order to come together, and that is the most sinister, lying, backstabbing thing you could do, and it works. It works for Fury, and I'm glad that they they made him ambiguous, um, while the other films kind of made him pretty much the good guy, with kind of mysterious kind of feel to him, but he wasn't as ambiguous as he was here. Uh, I guess one of the things I really disliked about the Avengers is, who is the S.H.I.E.L.D. Council? 
the people who sit in the dark and that are on screen and somehow rule the world. So, I want to know who those are. I don't remember them from the comics. And I always kind of came off as, she was always something of an independent um, operation. It's, you know, it's not CIA, it's not FBI, it's not really government sanctioned in a way. Uh, it almost like makes their own rules. And it's rules that they feel that is necessary for the world. So seeing that there's a council was really weird. And seeing that Fury had to basically kind of beg them is also really weird. Um, I'm not sure what they're gonna, why they're there. Maybe they'll be in the second Avengers movie. Maybe they'll be in the other Marvel movies, but I didn't see the purpose of them. Uh, I didn't see the need for them. I, I guess people say, oh, the need for them is so they can launch that that atomic missile and to uh, New York, and I guess that's okay. But um, you you could have done something else. Um, on the the subject of Mara Hill um, and Black Widow, Black Widow, while in interesting character has never been my favorite character. She was always a character who was the typical femme fatale. And um, you know, originally she was there for sex appeal and she was there to use her sexuality for material gain and for the gain of S.H.I.E.L.D. And they don't do that here, which I'm glad. I'm kind of happy that she doesn't flaunt around her sexuality, although Joss Whedon seems to be very much in love with her ass, so uh, with the, the shots that he constantly does, just happy Scarlett Johansson ass shots everywhere, and um, uh, and uh, uh, let me talk about Scarlett Johansson for a second here. I am not a fan of hers. Um, I don't think she's a good actress. She does okay as Black Widow. She's tolerable. She's, you know, I don't downright hate her, personally, I just don't think she's a very good actress, and I think she's very stiff, and I think she has the same expression for everything, <laughs> and, um, you know, look surprised, mer, look happy, mer, look sad, mer, so, it's, um, pretty much that, that same expression for everything, once in a while her eyes go big, that's about it, and, Here's the thing, I, I thought that the actress who did Mara Hill was, Kobe Smallers, was a lot better. And I would have loved to see her as Black Widow. She did a great job and uh, just stick her in a red wig and give her, please give her a Russian accent this time. And, um, or at least fake a Russian accent, something. Uh, and, uh, and do something. So, um, I guess Scar Scarlett Johansson can't do a Russian accent. Seeing Russian trailers of the Avengers, it was like, hey, it's nice to see her have an accent. So, so, um, um, that was kind of my two cents on Black Widow. I like the character in the movie. Didn't quite like her that much in Iron Man 2 because she was kind of shoehorned in there for no reason other than to kind of predict the Avengers coming in. Uh, she didn't necessarily need to be there, and she does okay, and she does okay in the film, and she's okay, so, yeah, just, you know, average, and, uh, there's nothing remarkable about it, it's very forgettable for us, but it's tolerable, it's okay. Um, Jeremy Renner as, um, as Hawkeye, um, I, I'm very thankful that they did not give him the purple Wolverine cow. Thank you for not doing that. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm, you see him in Thor, and a lot of people have complained that he was there and he never shot an arrow and seems like he was there for no reason. And yeah, he was, but it was a good cameo. And it's nice to see him there. And it's too bad he didn't shoot an arrow, but it's nice to see the relationship between him and Coulson and, and uh, his relationship to S.H.I.E.L.D. and his uh, wit. And I felt that Hawkeye could done so much more, but he, he spent like a good 
two acts and two like one and a half acts as the villain working alongside Loki being brainwashed by Loki and it's uh nice it's okay yeah I can't complain about the character I liked the character he wanted him to do more things and while um I liked him um kind of wish there was more of him so I have a better feel for his personality same thing with Black Widow Mara Hill I while I like the character I kind of don't know why she's there other than God, I hope she doesn't replace Coulson in the, the next Marvel movies. But there's a rumor that Coulson may return. Um, that uh, we don't know that Coulson has superpowers or not. So there's a good chance. There's always a, you know, a flip of a coin chance that he could return. And some people are saying that he's going to return for Iron Man 3 or Avengers 2. So who knows? Um, I'm... Uh, hope he comes back. I kind of understand why he wouldn't come back, but if he does, I'd be happy. Um, nobody really dies in comic books, and it's really nice to see Coulson get into uh, mainstream comics now, or well, at least in Ultimate Comics, and, uh, and I've collected a good deal of Coulson appearances in Marvel Comics so far, and it's uh, really nice to see him. Um, I hate the blonde hair, but, <laughs> oh well, but, uh, it's, uh, it's nice to see him in that, and um, one thing I was really kind of like bizarre with is uh, if anybody had seen pictures of Clark Gregg in Iron Man 2 behind the scenes, he actually wears a shield suit at one point and actually has this exoskeleton almost like a aliens with a, the, with a Ripley inside the inside the, 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 the carrier, that little exoskeleton carrier, and um, Coulson apparently had one too in Iron Man 2, and that scene was completely deleted. If you look up, Google it, um, Agent Coulson exoskeleton, that's one word, exoskeleton, E-X-O skeleton, and um, you will see him in the, the shield of military duds instead of the suit, and having the, the shield logo on him, and then in this really weird suit, what well, then makes me wonder why he uh, had a really weird gun in um, in Avengers. Um, yeah, he threatened uh, Loki with it. It's a big gun, and yeah, but how do you not know? I get. I guess that was a, a, a hydro weapon, but he apparently kind of like made it without knowing what it does. So I, I didn't fall for that, really. I think that Coulson is a character who has to know where, how everything works, and uh, he has to know what it can do, what it can't do, and what, it's, what you could make it do when the situation calls for it. Um, and um, Coulson just seems like that type of character, so I didn't really buy the fact that he had a gun that he had no idea what it could do or he was lying through his teeth. But, um, I was kind of hoping that he would get a friggin' exoskeleton and come out like Ripley and it's like, come out here, you bitch. So, so, um, I would have liked to see that and, uh, it would have been nice. And I have to admit that, uh, Coulson Seth, while sad, it was really nice to see him basically give Loki a big bitch. Song. I feel Loki gets beat up a lot in this film. And, um, uh, being my favorite character is really. He going, oh, 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 <laughs> poor Loki. Um, that was a lot of me in the theater going, oh. <laughs> um, and, um, but I'm glad that he is not. There's so many films out there where the villain never gets touched at all. And that always bothers me when he could be touched. Um, Loki, unfortunately, does a lot of pratfalls and, um, it's nice to actually see him get hit. Some of the ways he gets hit, it's almost hysterical. So, um, take for example the ending where uh, <laughs> uh, Loki gets kind of like, um, gets uh, an arrow thrown at him. He catches the arrow and, when you catch an arrow, please let it go. <laughs> Instead, he 
cut the arrow and does a smug look and it explodes and he gets off his uh, little uh, Centauri um, um, uh, tank and falls down into Stark Tower and then here comes the Hulk, comes over here and is about to beat him up and he's like, ENOUGH! I'm a god, you puny! You, uh, uh, you lesser being and all of a sudden the Hulk takes him and just beats him like a rat <laughs> and it's a great scene. I, but there was a sense of me, I felt really bad laughing because it was my favorite character being, getting the shit kicked out of him in the best possible way, <laughs> but, uh, he deserved it and, uh, he has this look at the end of, uh, being smacked down by the, by the Hulk where he either really wants to pee or just, my soul is in pain. <laughs> it really hurt my soul. <laughs> Um, the amount of damage that he got, how amazed that his uh, skull was even still in one piece. Um, it probably wasn't, but who knows. Um, but, uh, he was knocked out for a, a good while and he had this wonderful expression of it goes, Ow, my soul hurts. Ow, and, um, you really felt that pain. And, uh, it's great to see the Hulk do that. Now, I'm not sure exactly if that was a MacGuffin or not because it seemed like Loki was defeated a little too quickly. His army was... that I had no problem how that was defeated. Um, and uh, Loki himself, I... that was a good way for him to go, but it, it seemed so quick. And... Um, still, I couldn't think of any other way that he could go other than six of the Avengers basically putting him in a corner and beating the crap out of him. So, um, I guess that if he had to go one on one with someone, it's gotta be the Hulk. Now, there was something that was mentioned in the movie that never really came to term, and I'm not sure if anybody remembered it, but seeing that I've seen it like four times in the theater, um, yes, I've seen it four times. That's got that that's good and yes I paid like ten bucks every time. So um what people mentioned is when Black Widow goes to Loki's cage and basically tries to tell him his basically manipulates him to the point where he kind of says his plan, but his plan apparently she reveals is that Bruce Banner was is being controlled by Loki. That never comes to term. Um, there is a scene where Banner kind of picks up the spear, the scepter, and uh, basically looks like he's about to kill someone with it, but he puts it back and he gets snapped out of it, and all of a sudden you have the Hulk several, like the next act later, um, beat the crap out of, uh, out of Loki, and I kind of wanted to know how... Was he manipulating Banner? Was he manipulating Hulk? Um, the Hulk yeah, Loki seemed happy when uh, the his army was his minion, should I say, was breaking out of the helicarrier, and so I, I it seemed like a plot device that never went anywhere. So let's see, uh, I have complaints about Scarlett Johansson. I have complaints about the people in the dark room who apparently control S.H.I.E.L.D. and rule the world and the, the council and um, the crazy Hulk being possibly manipulated but not I don't know where that was going but I feel that's going to be a deleted scene and maybe they deleted it out because of time because it is a 2 hour 30 minute movie um, but those are kind of my main complaints and my main things about it. And a lot of, uh, let's talk about also, a lot of people have been comparing this movie to Transformers, and, um, I kind of, I get that, because if you look at the trailer, you have that, the big, giant, Transformer-like monster, this Leviathan, um, behemoth of a, of a thing, which I totally thought was Fing Fan Foom from, um, the Iron Man comics. And it's not. Silly me. 
Or uh, my friend thought it was uh, Jormander, which is Loki's one of Loki's children from the Norse mythology, the the sea serpent uh, with uh, armor on him, which was also a really good idea. Um, I wouldn't know where it's established if uh, Loki even had kids, but in this series, but we'll, we'll, we'll see. But um, we haven't known him that well yet, and. Um, but uh it could be and instead it was uh this just this being a uh soldier from the Centauri I can't pronounce them Centauri uh which is an ultimate villain a lot like the sc scrolls a lot of people thought it was the scrolls um not skulls but scrolls s, uh, s k r u l l s scrolls uh skulls and um uh, for the longest time, I thought it was the skulls too, but even though it didn't look like them, uh, but it's inside the Centauri or whatever, and um, and um, they did that. The way they uh, got them was cool, and um, uh, I thought it was very strange that they, I guess they acted like Borg. Uh, if you don't know Star Trek Borg Collective, um, they. Iron Man takes the missile that uh, the the shield people who badly rule the world who live in dark <laughs> the live in uh, dark room. They takes the missile and he goes up into a wormhole and destroys the mothership, I guess. And then all of a sudden these extraterrestrial beings kind of fall over like you just killed the queen and and uh, all of a sudden the entire hive mind kind of breaks down. And though we weren't really sure. Because they look like biological beings and would be sentient, and I guess they weren't. And um, I don't know much about the Centauri because I don't really read the Ultimates. So what I know is really in the film, and um, that's fine, I guess. Um, it's nice. I mean, it's a good way to end those villains and how to defeat them. Let's also talk about. The, the the two endings um Thanos uh when I was in the theater in my Loki costume I stood there and wanted to see the the last uh two two little shorts in the end the, the after the credit scene and suddenly the ambiguous man that ambiguous alien that Loki did shady, shady deals with was Thanos, T-H-A-N-O-S. Um, that was interesting, but the problem was this, Thanos is kind of boring. Um, Thanos is a really boring villain, and of all the villains you can bring to the Avengers, bring Thanos? Um, while I was sat there and they're going, oh no, it's Thanos, oh crap, so I sat there doing that. Uh, my friend behind me is like, who's Thanos? And he goes, it's a, a Marvel villain who kind of came on and off as a villain. He kind of was here during, I guess, the 70s and then came back in the 90s after like a 20-year absence and then kind of came back again. And he is um, basically the, uh, the, the bringer of death and he's the god of death, basically based off the Greco-Roman um, a uh, god of death named as Thanatos, and, uh, which is very similar to Xanatos in that. But, um, it's not Thanatos, and Thanos was a person who was kind of a tragic character because he fell in love with Madame Death, the, the bringer of death, and, uh, basically the, the Grim Reaper, and he wanted to impress her by trying to basically rule the world and um, he came from a society called Titan which was a moon on Saturn and all Titan Titanians were um, peace loving people but um, he unfortunately looked uh, different and I guess if you look different you can't be good <laughs> I guess that's what the comic was saying and uh, because he looked like uh, uh, one of the enemies he acted like an enemy and killed his father and his 
mother and his um, brother, well, not his brother, but and uh, all those things, and really, he's not, he's kind of a one-note villain, and I'm curious to see how they expand him, because Loki, honestly, is a very one-note villain in, in the Thor comics, and they did a great job on him with the film, so I'd like to see how they do with Thanos. Now, a lot of people have complained, people did not know that the American version actually has a second behind-the-scenes credit scene, so if you are in America and you have not seen the film, stay till the end of the credits. Please do, because there's a wonderful scene, uh, and I'm going to spoil it here, but uh, assuming that you have seen it, you're going to listen this far, but the scene is basically this one little hole-in-a-wall place in New York, somehow open during the destruction of New York, uh, uh, is, uh, serves the Avengers hamburgers and fries, <laughs> and it's the most awkward dinner, lunch scene that you have ever seen. They're, they just eat their, eat and drink their, um, their food, and they're not talking. That's kind of how the Avengers are, yeah. So, uh, these characters who don't really know each other, and they kind of don't, and then when they do hang out, they don't say anything. That's the first movie, so, uh, it's actually wonderfully awkward. It's bizarre, um, seeing, um, Thor eat a hamburger. <laughs> but, um, this scene was filmed, uh, about two weeks after the film was really was going to be released, two or three weeks before the film was going to be released in America. Those who complained that the Europe was getting it first, we have that scene. We American, we Americans have that scene, which they do not have, and I guess they'll get it, get it in the in their DVDs. But uh, we have that scene. It's a great scene, short, thirty minute, thirty second scene, I guess, and um, and and uh, that's the adventures. Um, I guess we should. Um, I get, I think I got off tangent and said, let me talk about. Um, the Transformers versus Avengers aspect. A lot of people have been um, comparing the two now. I hate Michael Bay. It's anybody who knows me can can tell you that I despise that man. And yeah, I do enjoy the the 2010 uh, Nightmare on Elm which he funded. He did not have any creative say on it. Thank God. So. Um, but, um, the Transformers, like I said before, it was, a uh, one who would get into the action very, very quickly, would get to that high point and then stay in that point while Avengers keeps on, builds up, and, uh, one thing a lot of people are comparing is that the action scene in the climax is very Transformer-y. Um, I guess you can say that because of all the crap going around everywhere, but I'll, I'll give you this, um, the thing about Transformers is that Michael Bay can't direct, he can't write, and he can't film anything, and, uh, when he does the Autobots and Decepticons, uh, fighting each other, yeah, you can say that, yeah, the Decepticons have red eyes and they look like insects, the Autobots have blue eyes and they kind of have color, not really, <laughs> and the only people you really do is Bumblebee and Optimus Prime, but barely, and then all of a sudden you're looking on the screen and you can't tell them apart, they fight the exact same way, they look far away from the exact, exact same way, you can't see their eyes half the time, and you can't tell who's fighting you and who's winning or anything like that, things just kind of rush through the screen, everything's a blur, and um, it's uh, really sad that Michael Bay has transformed Hollywood the way that it has now with action scenes this way. Um, the thing about Avengers is that you can tell who who is who and who is winning, and you can tell which is Loki and um, with his horns and everything, with his green cape, and um, you can tell who the Centauri are with their 
gray on gray. And then you have the Avengers who are all very different, who all have very different fighting styles. You have Thor with his hammer, um, it's very huge and brutal and savage. Then you have Captain America which is his shield and he's blue and he's um and he uses his shield but he also uses very hand to hand combat. Then you have Scarlet Johansson's um uh Black Widow and even though she and Hawkwing a uh, hot sorry, excuse me, Hawkeye have very similar costumes because they're shield uniforms, you could still tell them apart. And they still have very different fighting styles. You have the arrows, then you have the dual guns, and of course, um, one of the things that I thought was really strange is um, um, I know that Black Widow uses her her um, bracelets, her stingers. I think that's what they're called, stingers, once in the film, but we never really see them in action. She kind of like climbs on top of us and and just kind of electrocutes the crap out of one. Uh, with her with her bracelets and I've like I would have liked to see the shooting uh poison darts and and everything. Um I guess I was a little disappointed with that. Kinda got what they were going for but kinda would like to see that. Um with uh, Iron Man he's the only one that flies. He's big red and yellow. He's flying through the sky and no one ever looks like him. So the the thing is um what I'm saying is that it's nice that you can tell who's who, and that sounds really stupid, but it's true, how much that really, really helps, that we don't have to kind of guess who, who is who, we know who they are, it's uh, very, very clear who's winning, it's very, very clear who's fighting, even if, even if there are like tiny little dots on screen, you can still tell, oh, that's blue, that's Captain America, and, you know, and you can tell each one has a different fighting style, everyone has a different costume, so you can tell everyone apart and that's very I'm very thankful for that and unfortunately uh, Michael Bay does not do that and I'm kind of glad I'm hoping that Avengers excuse me, excuse me, uh, is going to keep that and keep that in films rather than Michael Bay taking over Hollywood um, what else can I say about this? I really can't think of anything. Um, I think I have said everything I need to know or needs to be said. I'm pretty sure you've heard it before, but who knows. Um, this is my own analysis on them. Uh, I guess that's it. Um, I've seen it four times. We'll see it again, actually this weekend with a whole bunch of friends. And I'm dragging them to the theater with me uh, because they haven't seen it yet. And um, hopefully they'll like it. I'm pretty sure they'll like it. Uh, it's great to see this franchise bloom the way it is. And it's really sad that, uh, believe it or not, I absolutely hate the Nolan Batman films. And I'll give you a big reason why. Uh, it's not my Batman. And uh, it's, um, I absolutely despise, I like the way he, the thoughts, okay, Batman Begins, stupid, it, it was boring, I fell asleep in that, tried to watch that thing twice in the theater, could not get it, tried to rent it, and um, tried to give it a third chance, still fell asleep, boring, boring, boring film, and then you have uh, The Dark Knight, which is the most overblown, overrated film of all time, it's not that great, yeah, Keith Ledger died because of the role, but didn't Brandon Lee do the exact same thing? And that was a good film. Well, more people kind of made that film bigger than it should be because Brandon Lee died. And um, I, I kind of felt the same thing with this film. It's not as good as people think it is. There's plot holes that you can drive a semi-truck through, and, um, uh, it's not that great, and it doesn't deserve a Best Actor Award. You can argue with me if you want. You go ahead, try, and I will give you my complete reasons, and also, um, I would like to see a Justice League film. It means 
a Justice League film could be possible if an Avengers film is possible. So if we could just get over this um, ultra-realistic thing and start really, and getting DC to act, put their act together, because really, um, they have their entire, their entire intellectual properties, they, they still own, um, Warner Brothers and all that, they can still do Wonder Woman film, uh, Superman film, which is coming out, Man of Steel, uh, The Dark Knight Rises, which a lot of people saying is going to dwarf the Avengers premiere, which is most grossing opening premiere, by the way, of one number one, uh, largest grossing, uh, weekend, and they said that Dark Knight Rises will beat that. I don't know, just, I, I've kind of read some of the script, and it doesn't look good, so, we'll see, I'll, I'll watch, I'll give it a chance. Um, they're also ruining my favorite character, which is Catwoman, but, um, uh, seeing how that is possibility. I hope that the... Well, what's really strange is that when Marvel cartoons are actually... The animated shows are actually very bad. No, I mean, they're not... They're good, uh, but they're, for the most part, they're not that great. I liked uh, Earth's Mightiest Heroes. I like uh, Spectacular Spider-Man, even though that wasn't... Nobody got profit from that. Um... It was amazing. If you haven't seen that, it's great. Uh, Ultimate Spider-Man kind of sucks, and I only watch it because of Coulson. And um, even though Paul Denny does it, and I love Paul Denny. And um, uh, it's just, they don't do very good animation. And you'd think that after being merged with Disney, that would make it better being a Disney animator myself. But um, it's really funny that DC kind of DC kind of blooms in animation uh, with uh, Under the Red Hood, with the Wonder Woman film, with the, the, the um, Batman Brave and the Bold, which is, people need to give more credit for because that was a brilliant series. And, um, but in film-wise, they kind of suck. DC sucks films, but Marvel has been doing great in films while they've been doing kind of sucking in animation while DC does immensely popular animation and I always thought that was very ironic and now that Avengers has come out can we expect a Justice League? Hopefully now that I believe that Punisher has gone back to Marvel and but Spider-Man and X-Men have not and neither has Fantastic Four so People are wondering, like, oh, why can't Fantastic Four be next in the adventure? Okay, the reason why is because they, a long time ago, they bought, they sold out their intellectual franchises to different companies. Um, Sony owns the movie rights for Spider-Man, and as long as they make Spider-Man films every couple of years, they can keep that, and Marvel really gets very little profits out of that. And... Fox owns X-Men franchise, and they're going to keep that as long as they can make films, because as long as they they make films as much as possible, they can get the money they want, they're never going to leave those franchises back to Marvel, so we'll never see, you know, Wolverine and a Captain America movie, or a Spider-Man and the Avengers, or, or the Thing versus the Hulk, or we'll never see that, uh, because they simply won't release the rights and let Marvel buy them back and however DC has all theirs why can't we see uh, a better Superman movie and I hope that Zack Snyder who did Watchmen who I, which I loved by the way uh, anybody who knows me will know that I loved the Watchmen film uh, at least the, the ultimate cut and um uh, and it, 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 I'd like to see a Martian Manager, who is another one of my favorite films, um, my favorite comic book characters. Wonder Woman, please, God, please make a Wonder Woman film. I would love to see it. And um, really just, a lot of people will make fun of the, the animated feature. I thought it was great, and personally, if you made that into a live-action film, I would 
totally go for that. And, um, you know, I'll bring, uh, bring Steve Trevor back, and please don't make him an old man like he did in Redcon. So, um, I would love to see a Blue Beetle, see a Booster Gold. Never happened. Booster Gold TV series, apparently, but not a Booster Gold film. Or a Blue, uh, Blue Beetle film. Or a Blue and Gold film. Come on. <laughs> That's comedy gold right there. And, uh, I'd, I'd like to see that, and... They tried with Green Lantern, they didn't try hard enough. Um, but apparently they're green uh number two, so who knows? Um, we'll see. But, um, that's, that's it, I think. So I'm gonna sign off right here. I hope you enjoyed it, I hope you, I babble a great, a great deal, I hope you don't mind that. And, uh, Thanks for listening. If you even listen to this, okay, bye.